Welcome to Stitched, Regional Dress Across Europe. This exhibition draws from the tremendous holdings of the Kent State University Museum and includes examples of what's often called folk dress or traditional dress. This clothing was worn by rural people across Europe and is often looked at as signaling differences, differences between villages, between men and women, differences between members of different religious groups. However, rather than looking at this in this divisive way, this exhibition looks at commonalities. Common features, including things such as stripes, floral brocading, lace, or metallic elements. These common features are the organizing principle of this exhibition and show the common threads across the continent rather than the differences. The first section of the exhibition that we're going to look at are the stripes. And stripes are actually a basic outgrowth of the weaving process. The way that the loom organizes two sets of threads where there's one that's horizontal and one that runs vertically allows for the easy construction of a striped pattern. And so you see this emerge in regional dress across the continent. So you can see that there's examples such as this first vest from Romania where the stripes run in a vertical direction, which means that there were alternating colors in the warp. Then the next piece from Estonia, the stripes go in the opposite direction. The colors are created in the weft threads, which alternate in color. Then there's examples that get even more complicated, and you can see that in this apron on the wall from Macedonia. In this one, while there's an overall horizontal pattern, it's a more complicated striped pattern. And then they've added to the striping by this fringe. And the fringe has alternating colors in it, so it creates effectively stripes, even though they're not exactly created through the woven process. And similarly, you can see the addition of applied elements in this apron from Bulgaria. And while there's striping at the waist area and then in the side sections of it, the overall stripe that runs along the hem is actually created with an applied element. So you can see that the applique enhances the overall striped quality in the woven design. In the case here, we see an outfit that belonged to Queen Marie of Romania. It includes stripes that run both vertically and horizontally. And rather than a simple alternating pattern of color, the weaver went above and beyond and created these designs in a tapestry weave technique. And while there's these ornate designs, it actually is a striped pattern to it. The final piece in this section is a underskirt from Volendam in the Netherlands. And this would go underneath the overskirt and be mostly hidden from view. In this exhibition, I've chosen to separate out the pieces and not include all of them as complete outfits because when this was worn in its entirety, you barely see the stripes at all. And so by isolating the different pieces on view, you can really see the common threads that run through all of these pieces. You can see, for instance, the use of bold stripes here in this underskirt. This section of the exhibition focuses on floral patterning in the weaving structure that are created either through brocading or jacquard looms. Into the 19th century, there was enormous progress in the mechanics of weaving and new weaving technology, such as the jacquard, which enabled elaborate patterning. Folk dress, which is often thought of as being homemade or made locally, depends largely on these manufactured goods featuring patterns woven on jacquard looms. So you can see ribbons, for instance, were widely available throughout Europe. And they were incorporated into fashionable dress, but they also made their way into folk dress. And many of these pieces, such as this Danish bonnet, largely focus on the tremendous fabrics. The ribbons are really the feature of this bonnet, through the bow and then the ties, really is a means of showcasing these textiles. 
the blue ribbon on the next bonnet is also very elaborate and clearly made on a jacquard loom, but it supplements the embroidery of the silver bonnet. It's a combination of hand technique with these mechanized products, which were widely available in the marketplace. You can see in this series of vests from Slovakia the way that these mechanically produced and manufactured goods were combined with handwork. There were elaborate little triangles that were added around the edges. There were fabrics that were combined with ribbons. So you can see the showcasing of handwork, but also the essential quality of these manufactured goods that really made for the distinctive styles of these folk costumes. Folk did not necessarily develop in antithesis or in opposition to mechanization. The mechanization and the technological advancements of the era were incorporated and were essential into the sort of flowering of elaborate regional designs. The most opulent sort of example of this in this section is this Hungarian ensemble. And you can see the juxtaposition of hand work, such as the embroidery on the blouse and the vest, with the manufactured fabrics, such as the brocaded skirt with its floral pattern. And the apron really combines these two things beautifully. You can see the ribbons that are added to it and then covered with sequins and embroidery and then fringe is added and then other decorative elements. So the whole thing has this very elaborate intersection between manufactured and handmade. It also has an aesthetic that is very busy. There are these patterns and colors that don't coordinate in the way that fashionable urban dress would, where you have coordinated colors and matching trim. Instead, you see this very discordant combination of colors and textures. The next section of the exhibition assembles pieces that include metallic elements in their design. The use of metal really showcases how expensive some of these pieces were. We often think about regional dress as being peasant costume and humble. And a lot of these cases, particularly ones in this section, really showcase that that is a misconception about these styles. For instance, this ensemble from Romania includes metallic elements in each component part, from the veil, which has little bits of gold and brocaded into it, to the sequins on the blouse, to these silver patterning on the apron. The next grouping of pieces in this section show the influence of the Ottoman Empire on regions of Europe and the area around the Balkans. This Albanian vest, which is extremely heavy, has a velvet base, which is then covered almost entirely with gold ribbons and cording. The jacket on the wall shows even more clearly the velvet ground, and you can see these ornaments in gold that are attached to it. The Bulgarian vest, you can see the ground also more clearly, which is a more modest material, but then you can see the layering and application of different styles of gold work. There are rickrack, there's ribbon, and then there's sequins covered with pearls or beads. As we move to the next garment, you can see this one is from Switzerland, and it has silver instead of gold on it, but these filigreed flowers that are used to attach the cording are extremely elaborate and would have been made specifically for this style of dress. At the shoulders, you can see there are chains that are draped from the front to the back of the garment. In addition to these filigree ornaments, there are steel beads embroidered onto the velvet that are in the shape of flowers. Steel beading is actually a common element that you'll see in fashionable dress and accessories from this time period. But this garment is very clearly regional to the area in Bern, Switzerland, particularly in the village of Emmental. 
And as we go into the next case and look at these bonnets, again, you can see the mix between fashionable and rural dress. Regalhaube, which is the style of bonnet from Bavaria, these were actually worn not just in the countryside, but in the cities. So these were worn in cities such as Munich, and you can see they're entirely covered with silver and would be very expensive and ornate. All of these bonnets show the incorporation of gold and silver into the bonnet through various techniques which are labor intensive. And so they require great skill from the artisans who crafted them. So there's a combination of expensive materials with great hand skill and knowledge. So far in this exhibition, all the pieces that we've looked at have been examples of women's wear. But that is not to suggest that only women were distinctive examples of regional dress. This next section, which features braid as ornament, showcases a number of examples of men's wear. For instance, this first ensemble from Romania is a complete three-piece suit and coordinated shirt. And this resembles the cut of fashionable men's wear at the time. However, the white wool and the use of braid that outlines all of the edges of the jacket, the vest, and the pants are really distinctive and mark this as an example of regional dress from Romania. This interplay between the conventional cut of contemporary men's fashionable dress and regional dress is showcased in the rest of these examples that we have of men's wear. These vests are made of wool, and in the case of the middle one, it's a black wool with black trim, which really is similar to the all-black color palette of fashionable urban dress. It pushes the boundaries of what would be acceptable for men in that it has this more playful collar treatment. The examples of flanking it are also wool that have been covered with braid. And while the cut is more in line with urban dress, they have this color palette which is much bolder than was acceptable for fashionable dress. We have either this example with a black ground with red braid embroidery, or this piece which has the whole spectrum of primary colors in braid. The two pieces on the top have a different material that they're made out of. The first one is actually sheepskin, which has been covered entirely on the surface by a colorful braid and even metal studs. And then this last piece is an example of women's wear. And the color palette is extremely bold with these orange and blue and green colors of braid. And then the cut of it is different. It is shaped so that it curves around the chest and then extends into these tabs, which would be held in place under the belt. <laughs> Well, fashionable urban dress often incorporated embroidery, which was executed in silk floss. Regional dress frequently has the embroidery done in coarser wool yarn. These examples in this next section all feature yarn as the ornament. For instance, this Russian skirt, you can see how elaborate and beautiful the embroidery can be executed in yarn. This Norwegian ensemble is also embroidered in yarn, and the palette is very subdued with coordinated pastel pinks and greens, and the whole thing is absolutely matching from the bonnet to the vest to the purse to the embroidery around the hem of the skirt. A subdued palette is also apparent in this overskirt from Romania with this navy blue ground rust and a sort of subdued olive green. In contrast to that, the color palette of this Romanian skirt is much bolder with a very hot pink and red embroidery. This apron from Portugal has a very bold color palette featuring pink and really bright green. The embroidery that's done on this is a technique which closely resembles a hooked rug. The technique of creating a textured looped pattern also appears in this vest from Romania. 
The edging around the neck and the sleeves is done in a technique which seems to evoke Persian lamb, but is done in yarn. The abundance of yarn on this bonnet from Spain really showcases how colorful and bold and playful yarn can be on regional dress. The straw bonnet is embellished with layers of appliqued fabric, buttons, yarn, and then these glorious pom-poms, and is finished in the very center front with a mirror. We've looked at examples where yarn is used as a decorative element to embellish garments. The next section looks at pieces where it's the yarn that's used as the primary element itself in making up the piece. And this is really the case largely with knit stockings. And we have a number of examples of different types of, of knit stockings. The first one that we see is here with this gentleman who's from the Alps, from Bavaria in particular. And he's wearing an outfit that includes lederhosen, which are short and only go down to the knee. And because you see the entirety of his leg, there's these decorative pieces that are added. While the knit itself is quite simple, it has these pieces that are added around the calf, these sort of gaiters, that are quite distinctive and are what makes this distinctive to this region. We can see a similar portion of the body is highlighted in these stockings from Estonia. So while these stockings go all the way up the thigh, the decorative portion really circles the calf in the same way that you saw in the Bavarian man's outfit. But rather than being a separate piece, you see that the ornamentation is done with knit work itself. And there's bright colors and patterns in these diagonals. And because it would be worn with the skirt that we saw earlier, it echoes the stripes in the horizontal and vertical direction that are around the hem of the skirt. The next piece, these stocks from Albania, have similar diagonal patterns, but the diagonal patterns in these diamonds cover the entirety of the socks. In fact, even the bottom of the sole of these stockings is covered with a pattern. The socks from Serbia are very intricate in their design, but rather than these geometric shapes and the diagonals, these have more sinuous shapes in a floral pattern. The pattern is done mostly through the knit, as you see around the bottom of the sock, but then as you get up to the top around the leg, the flowers are executed in what looks like a needlepoint design. These pieces would have taken a lot of work by the person who made them, and they were highly valued. And because they were so labor intensive, they would be preserved through repairing them as they wore out. You can see on the Estonian stockings, if you look closely at the heel, there's a part where they're starting to get a hole, and it looks like someone has made the effort to darn them. While knitting is one technique to create a textile from yarn, you can also see crochet is used to make pieces. In this first bonnet from uh, Slovakia, the crochet is used to create a sophisticated lace. There is tape work around the edges of the bonnet in white, and then the ground of the bonnet is made primarily in black. And the contrasting colors make this quite a striking piece. The ultimate shape of it is largely through the use of starching and then creating it into these wings and peaked front. Similarly, starch is used heavily in this lace bonnet from Follendam in the Netherlands. The iconic winged shape of it is created by first pleating the lace and then holding it into these shapes while starched. The shape of this piece is very recognizable as being from this region and in fact has come to represent the nation of the Netherlands more broadly. And while the lace is very beautiful, it would have been purchased on the market rather than actually being made at home. What makes this a distinctive regional item is less the material itself, but its usage and its shaping into this garment. 
Well, the lace becomes the dominant feature of this particular garment and thus the ensemble. Lace is also used as an accessory or trimming in a number of regional dresses. In this outfit from southern Moravia in Slovakia, you can see lace as an accent on each element of this piece, from the vest to the sleeves of the blouse to the apron. And these are a combination of manufactured lace and then hand work. For instance, as we look closely at the sleeves, you can see that these are all embroidered with black thread to really create an accent piece. The lace on this is quite colorful and is a really dominant feature of this piece. In contrast, when we look at this piece from Serbia, this skirt and apron, the lace is very coordinated with the color of the embroidery and matches with the overall piece. It becomes a finishing element, but does not really dominate the visual appeal of this piece. This outfit is paired with a pair of socks, which are knit, but are knit in a pattern which very much resembles lace or could even be considered a form of lace. And these socks are really not the prominent feature of this. They're almost an undergarment. And similarly, this skirt from Slovakia also includes lace trimming, but is itself more of an undergarment and wouldn't be the feature of the outfit. You can see the lace as a trimming to beautify the piece without being really the element that attracts attention. And finally, this man's shirt from Romania, you can see the white work is a subtle addition to the piece. The white on white embroidery and lace really blends into the overall effect. And because it isn't really flashy, it is somewhat understated. Although when one looks closely at the work, at the hand embroidery that's done on it, at the open work, the seams on it, it really is a stunning, although subtle piece. The second gallery of the exhibition is focused on one particular element of regional dress, the peasant blouse. Along this back wall, we see examples of traditional blouses from all over Europe, and you can see the tremendous variation across the continent. While a seemingly simple piece, it has tremendous potential in differences for ornamentation, design, and cut. It is worn not only by women, but men as well. The first two examples you see are from the same region of Slovakia. And you can see the similarities in ornamentation between the men's and women's outfits, but you also see the differences in the placement of the decoration and the cut of the shirt. The blouses varied in hem length, material. There are different cuts to the way that the sleeves are attached to the body. And they vary widely in ornamentation. As we looked in the first gallery at different decorative elements that are added to regional dress, we can see many of the examples included in these blouses, from metallic elements to yarn embroidery to lace. You can see wide variations in the technique even within the embroidery. Some of the examples are very heavily embroidered, so densely embroidered that you don't see the underlying material. And then other examples, such as this blouse from Romania, are actually created out of beads. While it looks from a distance to be simple embroidery, up close you can see the addition of these tiny beads. We see a range of material that are included in these pieces, from blouses that are very sheer to pieces that are quite coarse and heavy. Along with these heavy blouses, we see ornamentation which is often also very dense and covers completely the ground material. This can be seen in this Romanian blouse and also in this piece from Macedonia. The piece from Macedonia includes this heavy yarn embroidery and finishes with fringe at the cuffs. In the final piece along this wall is an example from Greece, and it's from the same village that we'd seen a vest earlier in the previous gallery. 
You can see the arrangement of the decoration would complement the placement of the outer garments. For instance, you can see that it's placed around what would be covered with the vest and also would be revealed at the hem underneath the skirt that would be worn over it. The central platform in this gallery focuses on the ways that the peasant blouse has inspired fashionable dress. The earliest examples that we have in the exhibition are from the 1920s, which was a period of a great deal of upheaval in Eastern Europe, and there was a great migration of people from Russia and the East into fashionable capitals such as Paris and New York. You can see many of them brought their techniques and know-how with them, and they incorporated many styles from regional dress into fashionable garments. This first blouse you can see has smocking and embroidery around the neck. The general cut of it is very much evocative of peasant blouses. Similarly, this dress from the 1920s shows smocking around the yoke, waist, and at the cuffs. The overall effect is very evocative of the peasant blouse, but it does reflect the fashionable tubular silhouette of the 1920s. Again, these two examples that we look at, one from Romania, the second from Italy, show the combination of techniques of European folk dress, such as counted embroidery, combined with the silhouette of fashionable 1920s dress with the straight up and down cut. The Italian example, you can see the influence of rural culture in the inclusion of these delightful little roosters. The final two examples are more recent. We have a piece by Yves Saint Laurent, which is from his 1976 Russian collection. You can see the inspiration that he drew from Eastern Europe with the peasant style blouse that is combined with a paisley skirt. And finally, we have this ensemble by Oscar de la Renta from the 1980s. He evokes the peasant style with the shape of the blouse with its ruffled collar. He chooses a material which is a sheer silk, which is not similar at all to what would be seen in regional dress. He combines a number of elements that we've already seen. There's the lace, there is the brocaded ribbon, and most importantly, there is this layering effect of different patterns. The combination of a variety of different color and floral designs is very evocative of the use of patterning in regional dress. Thank you for joining me on this tour of stitched regional dress across Europe. We've looked at the tremendous diversity in regional dress, but more importantly, we've seen the common threads that have run through examples from across the continent of Europe. While we think of regional dress as being a relic of the past, it continues to be an important legacy and an inspiration to designers of today. Mm -hmm.